I was, um, as we were sitting there worshiping it, not that this has anything to do with my sermon, but I was thinking um, about how uh, right after John had got this church started and I was doing a church, different church plan, I had asked him what he named this church and he said it was, it was called Harbor. And I said, well, that's a fantastic name because it's sort of a place you can go when your life is stormy and you can you can sock into this nice harbor and it'll be it'll be peaceful and restful and uh, encouraging for you and you can wait out the storm there. And uh, he looked at me and goes, that's not what I meant at all. <laughs> a harbor is where people like it's buzzing with opportunities and people are connecting with other people and then they they sail off from that into their adventures and and that's what a harbor is. And I go. And then he goes, well, you named your church the well, and that's just stagnant water sitting in <laughs> No, but I was thinking about it as we were kind of, um, as I was reflecting on our prayer request, maybe it's both. Maybe this is a place that you can come when your life is, is stormy and you can find some, some peace and some encouragement and get through the storm. But it's also a place where we step out in faith and into an adventure. And as we have gone through the book of Acts, that's what it's about the adventure of being the people who Jesus continues to work through even after his resurrection. And so we're going to look at Acts uh, chapter 16, verses 6 through 15, if you have a Bible. And uh, as you kind of find your way there, or if you have an app or whatever, um, I just want to start by, by sharing a little story. Um, we're going to be looking at how do we allow God to work in our lives. And um, uh, one of the ways that we have been blessed, Christina and I, we've been blessed with a new vehicle to drive around in, and, um, and, and when we first got it, I didn't get a lot of opportunity to drive it, because, um, well, Christina's always driving it, and um, I'm, I'm sitting there going, man, I want to drive that car, I want to be at the helm and get to decide where to go, and um, and then it occurred to me, and I thought about the church, um, but it occurred to me that that's how um, often I think I am with God in my life, is that uh, the car is all set up for me, I've got it all set up, Christina's got her settings on how far back she is from the steering wheel and all that, and, and I've got my life beautifully set up for me, and um, I'm often in control of it, and I like the idea of God being... Um, in the passenger seat, and I think sometimes God is saying, I would rather be driving, actually, and uh, you should be in the passenger seat. I used to work in a Christian bookstore, and there was a bumper sticker that sold really well that always annoyed me, and it said, God is my co-pilot, you slapped it on your car, and I just thought that was weird, because God's really the pilot, and so we're going to look at how do we um, do some divine driving, how do we let God take the steering wheel of our lives, and what's that actually look like when we put it in practice, so... Um, let me read this scripture for us. Uh, Acts 16, starting in verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. And on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. And we sat down and we began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Let's pray. God, speak into our lives through this um, passage, through this account of um, you leading this group of, 
of missionaries um, into a new place. Hope connected to our lives. We love you. Amen. Well, um, as I was thinking on this topic of what's it look like for, for God to direct our lives, um, I was thinking back to how faithful God has been in, in areas um, of my own life. And, and one of the ways that I think God has really done incredible, incredible work is um, in our marriage, Christina and I's marriage. Um, last weekend we were away at a, a marriage conference. It was, it was a good time, but... Um, <clears throat> But I was thinking about it, and Christina and I's backstory, the families uh, are, are full of divorce everywhere you turn, multiple divorces, and not really good at this whole marriage bit. And uh, so we didn't have good patterns growing up, and um, and somehow, we, when we got together, realized, man, we are not prepared for this. And so we opened the door for God to, to lead us in it, and um, he put right people in our lives at the right time and created opportunities and, and he's been um, incredibly faithful when we handed over the steering wheel to him in that area. Um, currently, I need to hand over the steering wheel to him a little bit more in an area that um, has to do with confidence. I have a tendency to look around at you all and at the elders and such and go, did I do it right? Is it good enough? And um, God keeps nudging me out into these lands where I have to actually stand with him and trust him to be enough. Um, and I struggle with confidence nearly every time I preach. And so Christina has to put up with that in the morning, so it's amazing we're still married. Um, but uh, can you think of an area in your life where you would like to see God move? An area you would like to see strengthened? An area where um, you think some good things might happen if you were able to hand that over to the Lord, or maybe it's a relationship or a situation. Um, this passage that we're looking at has some keys on how to do it. Um, it gives us three things that, that happen in these guys' lives that I think can help us do that in our lives. Um, and the first one uh, is simply this. Um, let God have your plans. And it's interesting how God interacted with, with Paul and his missionary friends' plans. Let me read uh, verses 6 and 7 again for you. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And um, that kind of brings us to this, this first part of what it means to um, let God have your plans. And uh, it's to ask a question. And that is, am I being blocked? Uh, this is a strange thing. These guys were sent out. They were going to go share the gospel. They're heading towards Asia. And uh, they go, that's where we need to go. We're going over there, and that's where we're going to go preach. And we don't really know what it looks like when the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not going there. But it says first they were blocked, and then that the Holy Spirit wouldn't even allow them to. Um, and my guess is it was a series of events that happened in their lives. Maybe it was a, a clear sense among them all that this is not the way to go. Um, but sometimes I think we get to a place where we know we're not going in the right direction. Something happens in our lives. Um, I know one of the most often prayers that I've prayed is, God, just, just show me the right path to go. And um, sometimes that happens really beautifully. I know when I came to Harbor, um, I was clearly in a stuck spot that I could not move forward in, and Christina and I took a weekend to try and pray this thing through, and on we were on our drive home, I go, I should go work at Harbor. And I called John, and John goes, you should come work at Harbor. And it was very clear. Um, those are rare, friends, that those things seem to happen for me. A lot of times I pray and then I'm left with multiple options or no answer or paralyzed with no options still. Um, do you ever get paralyzed in those moments of too many decisions or no clear way forward? Um, and my tendency in those moments is to get frozen. Now what? And I just get stuck. And um, a good friend of mine, uh, I 
actually one of the guys who helped lead me to Christ. I was talking to him about needing to grow at some point in my journey. And he goes, you know, Chris, God doesn't steer parked cars. <laughs> That's true. And I wasn't taking any steps because I didn't know the right steps to take. He said, get moving and then let God steer you. And um, I think that's how part of this works. So this first, the first thing, if we're going to discern how God can impact our lives, I think is to go, am I stuck? Am I stuck in a rut? Am I stuck in a bad spot? Am I stuck in a place that's not working for me? Um, I know at one point when I decided I didn't want to be a pastor anymore, it had been a really, really hard season, and I said, I'm going to go back to being an um, admin assistant. I had done that. I could... I could file papers and be the nice guy at the front desk. I, I can do that. So I went back and, and started to do that, and it was not working. It was it was horrible. Um, another thing I'm thankful that I'm still married through, because Christina had to put up with me coming home and going, I can't deal with this job. It's horrible. And I was trying to grind it out, but I wasn't making any progress, and, and it wasn't working at all. And um, everyone around me could tell, and I could tell. Um, but I was stuck. And it's important in those moments to ask the question, is this working for me? Because if it's not working, it's time to go in a different direction. Um, and then this week, I was having lunch with a, a guy who I met when he was in sixth grade. He was in my youth group, and now we're good friends. And, um, we were talking, and I, I think I gave him some encouragement about something he could do in the mornings to connect with the Lord. And, um, and he goes, do you do that? <laughs> Wise kid. <laughs> and I said, you know, I used to. But lately, I've been getting up and playing video games. <laughs> How's that working for me? I miss my time with the Lord, actually. You need to make some adjustments. So, um, figure out where you're blocked. Figure out what it means to move forward is to stop doing that. The other side of that coin um, comes in verse 10. It says, after Paul had seen this vision of a man in Macedonia, we got ready to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. By the way, that's the place where you see us start to appear in the book of Acts. Um, Luke joined the journey before he had been writing about they and them. And now he says, us and we. But Paul had this vision. He, he went to sleep. He had this vision that night of this guy in Macedonia and said, we got to get up and go there. Um, now, it seems really easy in Scripture that these things happen, that you go, man, he just had this vision. God made it abundantly clear, and off they went, right? Um, but there were so many ways that they could have written that off. They could have gone, well, no, Jerusalem said we need to go to Asia. We're, we have this plan. We pulled out a map, Paul. We already looked at it. We already know which freeway to take. I mean, we have the GPS all set up. What are you doing? We're not going to Macedonia. They could have said, Paul, you probably ate something funny last night. No more mushrooms for you. <laughs> this was not a, a clear picture. But they woke up, and, and Paul goes, you know, I had this nudge to go over here and do this thing. And then he shared it with his friends who were with him, who knew the Lord. And, and they go, you know what? That does sound good, Paul. This isn't working over here. That sounds like a really good plan. And there's something about leaning into these places where we feel nudged, especially doing it with partnership with some other Christians and saying, this is a good idea. I'm going to find some awesome people. And... Um, I don't know if you remember, but when I first got here at Harbor, I, I started up a small group. And I was like, I want to do small groups. I like small groups, so I'm going to do one. And it was me and Larry and Alice. And then it was me and Larry. And then me and Larry stopped doing it. Um, and that was all of a process of about a month. Uh, it was just something I, I felt like doing. I, I leaned into it. I didn't have any community around me saying whether it was a good idea or not. And... Uh, and then recently started up another small group, and it was a very different experience. Just looking around and going, I think the church could use a small group now. And I began to talk to people, and they began to go, that's a good idea. 
Let's do it. And um, it's a totally different thing. Uh, it wasn't a bad thing that we leaned into that first small group. Uh, it's okay to lean into a nudge from the Lord and then go, huh, I guess it was just the pizza. <laughs> but um, there is something beautiful about taking that move. And God doesn't um, move park cars very well. So our sitting around often doesn't get it done. Recently, um, I have one of these little nudges that popped up in my life. Me and Molly um, take clothes down to Union Gospel Mission. Another thing I did when I first got here was go, hey, we should collect some clothes for Union Gospel Mission. It'll be fun. Let's do it. And um, Molly goes, yeah, we should. And she's kept doing it ever since. It's been two years of Molly bringing clothes down to Union Gospel Mission, and it's awesome. And um, I got the chance to go with her, and it was really fun. And and I got out of the car, and I had this bag of clothes, and I was handing it to the Union Gospel staff person, and he goes, are you a size 34 waist? I thought that was awkward. I said, sort of. Sometimes. Used to be. Uh, anyways, he goes, no, I, I, I just, there was a guy who was here earlier, and that's, what he needed. And so I was wondering if you were bringing your clothes. And I go, well, these aren't all my clothes. This is our church's clothes. Um, I'm a pastor at this church called Harbor Church. And, and he goes, oh, I'm the chaplain for the mission here. Um, you ever want to come down and preach? They, that'd be really cool if you came down and preached at the Union Gospel Mission. And I go, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm a brilliant pastor. But, uh, but he handed me his business card and goes, Thanks, just think about it. And so now I have this business card sitting on my desk. Um, but if I don't act on it, it's not going to go anywhere. So I think I need to lean into it. And we'll see what happens. Um, but it's these nudges. And I love how Paul and his friends uh, respond. Listen to it. After Paul had this vision, we got ready at once, they got going. Um, and from Troas, we put out to sea and we sailed straight for Samothrace and the next day to Neapolis. And from there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and leading city in the district of Macedonia. What it tells us is that he sailed for three days very, very directly. God gave me a nudge. I got to go. Let's go. Um, they go into it. Um, so, those two questions am I, am I being blocked? Do I see a seam that I need to lean into? And if there's that seam, take a step, take a leap, head that direction and see what happens. Um, so let God have your plans. The second key for um, letting God impact our lives, I think, uh, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went out to the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place to pray. And we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. It's to keep your eyes peeled. Be attentive to, the, to what's going on around you. Um, the normal method for what Paul would do is he would go to a town, and then he would find the synagogue, because he was, went to the best Jewish schools, he knew how to connect Jesus to the Jewish faith. And so he would go there, and he would start dialoguing with people and explaining to them that Jesus was the Lord and Savior. Um, and he shows up in Philippi, in Macedonia, just like that vision told him to. There's no synagogue. Hmm. All right, well, um, okay. Well, on the Sabbath, we'll go where the, usually you can find some Jewish people when there's not a synagogue, which is just outside the town, and um, we'll go to a landmark, like down by the river, and we'll, and we'll see if some folks are gathered there that we can talk to. So he goes down there, and there's some women working on dyeing some clothes. No Jewish gathering or place of prayer to be set for. And I think many of us in that moment uh, would go, Paul, it was the mushrooms, man. We sailed straight away. We took the vision. We get here. There's no synagogue. And not only that, we go to the place of prayer on the right day, at the right time, and it's not there. But they had their attentiveness. 
to the people around them, and they began to talk to them. And what they saw was this woman, Lydia, who God began to open up her heart, and that's exactly what it says. It says that Lydia's heart was opened up towards this. Um, there's this movement in society right now um, for mindfulness. Have you heard that term, mindfulness? Um, to me, it sounds like focus, but I kind of have ADD, so uh, <laughs> there's that. But mindfulness is being really attentive. It's giving all of your attention to one thing. And it's sort of a need that's developed in our lives because there's massive amounts of multitasking in media, and we've gotten really good at skimming through large amounts of information and flying along doing lots of things. And we've lost the ability to be attentive and focused. Um, this idea of mindfulness is not um, contrary from Christianity. As a matter of fact, it's been in it the whole time. Um, there's this old Celtic prayer, and I want to read it for you, and I think it captures what Christian mindfulness looks like. It says, Lord, this day, be within and without me, in me and around me, lowly and meek, and yet all-powerful. Be in the heart of each person to whom I speak, and be in the mouth of each person who's speaking to me. This day, be within and without me, lowly and meek, and yet all-powerful. And what that prayer is saying is that when you walk out in the morning, God is with you. He's going to guide you. He's going to use you. But nowhere else God is, all around you. And lots of little things, lowly and meek, and yet all powerful. Are you aware? Can you pay attention enough to see him? Will you let God show up in your day? Um, it's a crazy thing. I, I didn't bring the number because this occurred to me just this morning, but when you look through the Gospels and you look at the amount of ministry that Jesus did that was planned versus things that just came up, you will find that the great majority of what Jesus did just came up. He's sitting by a well and a woman shows up. He is walking with his friends trying to talk to them about something that was incredibly important and then somebody rolls up on him and goes, can you help me? My son has demon. And somebody asks him a question, and he goes, oh, well, let me give you a really incredible answer to that. Um, he was mindful. He was attentive. He was aware that God was at work in the world. And friends, it's an exciting thing to get up in the morning and go, no clue where God's going to take me, but he's going to use me, and he's going to show up. So will I be mindful of it? Um, it's sort of like a, a dog whistle. You know the sound is there, but most of us miss it. And I think with just a little bit of more attention, a little bit of asking God to show up and, and saying, I'm expecting to see you today, we'll actually be able to see um, God do some stuff. Here's a couple suggestions. Um, do you know your neighbors? My mom is incredible at knowing her neighbors. Um, she's attentive to the people around her and it's creating opportunities now that I get to go walk into um, this afternoon uh, one of our neighbors um, got diagnosed with cancer he's about to go through a really uh, aggressive treatment and the thing that he really really wanted to do before his treatment starts is carve a pumpkin my mom doesn't carve pumpkins very much or I don't know if she's even able to but I love carving pumpkins Christina always looks at me and goes, that's all you. But I will carve a number of pumpkins during this Halloween season. And I go, Mom, I have all the stuff. I got the little pumpkin saws and everything. I'll, I'll, can I come help Jerry carve pumpkins? And she's like, that would be fantastic. But there's this, this moment that God seemed to open up. So we'll see how that turns out. should be fun. But I'm hoping God shows up. I'm expecting it. Um, have you asked your coworkers how they're doing? Not just how they're doing with their work. People are looking for God and um, looking to be cared for and loved by him, I think. So they're there. Um, another one is helping people with a project. Um, my buddy Dan uh, had a neighbor who was totally into uh, beer making like home brewing and his garage thing. I wouldn't drink that stuff. But, um, but Dan really wanted to learn about this.
this. And so he decided to go meet his friend and, and hours spent making beer turned into good ministry time. And now that's a priority for Dan's life is to spend some time with this guy. Um, Paul showed up in the moment of his life that whether it looked like it was sacred or not, in this moment that he wasn't expecting, uh, it didn't turn out like they expected for this great ministry project. But he was there, and he was attentive. And there was this woman named Lydia who was waiting to meet the Lord. Um, the thing about Lydia that's really cool, too, she's um, from Thyatira, which happens to be in Asia, which is where Paul needed the gospel to go. So what is this woman doing in Macedonia? Well, she's a merchant. She's there doing her work. And um, they knew that the gospel had to get to this place. But the Lord didn't let them do it. Um, but Lydia was there. Uh, and when you look in Revelation chapter 2, you'll see letters to all the churches. One of them in there is the church in Thyatira. The gospel had taken root in Thyatira. And it was probably through Lydia. Um, one last key, besides being attentive, um, letting God have your plans, um, and that's to use your blessings. I told you a little bit about Lydia. She was a, a dyer of purple cloth. That's what we know. Um, purple cloth was incredibly hard to dye. It was expensive to dye because you have to do a lot to a piece of cloth to make it purple. And it was a highly desirable color. Um, and she was traveling around. And the other thing that we know about her is not only uh, was she from Thyatira, she had a nice home in Macedonia here. And um, it was a nice enough home that she could invite an entire group of missionaries to come stay at her house without it being scandalous at all. Um, which means she was incredibly well off. And notice the very first thing that she does after she comes to faith. Paul, you gotta stay in my house. If you consider me a believer in Jesus Christ, then let me show hospitality. She has these blessings and she uses them. And blessings often I found in my own experience and in talking with other people, they don't seem very profound to us because we're used to them. We have them. Um, and so we have these gifts, these talents, these resources, and, and we go, oh yeah, that's, that's just who I am. I, I welcome people in and I really like to make desserts. Um, and it's no big deal. But it's a big deal to the people who we actually share our resources and our gifts with. Um, and people do this stuff all the time around here. Dave Doherty has fixed so many things at this church and in different people's homes. But he knows how to put stuff together. When I try to put things together, they break. So, Dave uses his gifts. Um, she sure always helps out with the turkeys on Thanksgiving. Thank you, brother. It's a simple spot. Um, Molly keeps driving down to UGM for years on end, bringing extra clothes that we have brought to people who really need it. A little car. That's part of her talent and her gift and her willingness to keep doing it even when everybody else has stopped. Um, Jerry Gatlin leading small groups. They just use what they have, the resources they have to bless people. Christina and I do like hospitality. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about how I got started with hospitality as, as something that we like to do. Christina and I were pretty newly married. We went on a road trip. We were in Firebaugh, California, which if you've never heard of it, um, I'm not surprised. It is a tiny, tiny town that has a gas station. Um, that's pretty much what it's got going for it, and it's on I-5. Um, so we pulled in to this little tiny town to get some gas, um, and I got out, I pumped the gas, put the thing back on there, got back in the car, put the key in the ignition, and went to turn it, and it did not turn. The tumblers in the ignition had fallen apart, and it no longer worked in Fireball, California. So, Christina and I didn't know what to do. We had no clue, so we had to get the car towed to the nearest Volvo dealership, which is horrible that we had to go to a dealer to get this fixed, but we did. 
And so um, we got a tow to a dealership, which I think was in Sacramento or something. Fresno. Oh, it was in Fresno, another huge town. So we went to Fresno, got a tow there. And along the way, Christina called her mom and said, Mom, I don't know what to do. Um, our car's not working and we're in Fireball now on our way to Fresno. And she goes, I have an old high school boyfriend that I know that lives near there. I'll give him a call. So she calls up this guy, and he was in the middle of dinner with his friends. And he goes, no problem, I'll go pick him up. So he drove over from Clovis, California, which is another tiny, tiny, tiny town, picked us up, brought us back to his dinner with his friends, had us eat dinner with all of them, paid for our dinner, brought us back to his house, and then proceeded to show us for the next three or four days true hospitality. He welcomed us, he involved us in his life. We got to go have family with his dinner. He took me on a tour of all of Clovis. That was an interesting five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but we got shown the incredible, and we go, who is this guy? Your mom's ex-boyfriend from high school. <laughs> and he tried to convince us to stay in Clovis, and we wouldn't do it, because Christina would have been a really good public school teacher there. Um, but we, when we were finally driving away four days later with our car, we knew we got to show hospitality when we come back. This guy had a gift. He used it on a stranger generously and willingly. And um, he passed that gift on to us in some ways. Um, he got moved onto us, and, and now it's a part of our lives that we like to use. I want to read a passage for you, and maybe it's what it has to do with using our, our gifts. It's Romans 12, 6-8. It says this, um, We each have different gifts according to the grace that's given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. You all have tremendous gifts, talents, and resources. And all Paul is saying is, okay, those are you said, do so. And as you do, God will move in powerful ways. What would you like to see God impact in your life? Some relationship, some situation, some thing about your life that you would like to see impacted. Um, I know as pastor of this church, I want to see Harbor Church be a place that impacts the world um, in a powerful way for Jesus. And I think that's happening. And I know that it will continue to happen if we're willing to ask God, are we volunteer? Where do you want us to go? If we're willing to be attentive to the people who walk into our door and show them God's love as best we can, and if we're willing to use the gifts that we've been given as generously as we possibly can. And I think the same is true in each of our lives. As you go out into this week, um, may God move powerfully. May you sense his discerning direction May you lean into those nudges, even if you're not sure about it, and see what God can do. Let's pray. God, thanks for these examples um, from the book of Acts of how you continue to live and work and move in your people. Um, we don't glamorize them by, by thinking they're so far away from us that, that we can't imagine them happening to us because, Lord, you send us out and you go with us and you are within and without us. So, Lord, um, be in our lives, work through us, and be in the lives of everyone around us, and speak to us. We're open to your leading, and we love you very much.